also hear you. Let us pray. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Job chapter 38. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors, with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. The word of God, the word of life. Thanks be to God.
chapter 6. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The word of God, the word of life. And speak to God. unpredictable sea, the wild, stormy sea. Our story begins with Jesus standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, saying to the apostles, let us cross to the other side. And as they crossed, the wind began to blow, the waves began to rise, and Jesus began to sleep. Have you ever been in a storm at sea? or on a wind-tossed lake. One sea captain describes a storm at Cape Horn at the tip of South America this way. He says, 
The mighty swell of waters, giant forces, seem to be pressing upon us, crowding together millions of tons of turbulent water. The force creates a sharp piling up of eddies and backwaters in which the largest ship can become unmanageable. Currents and waves swell, and the rocks wait with the cold sea snarling impatiently around them. It's not an ordinary ocean. Swells rolling on and on, as no one is accustomed to see. These waves rush perpendicular, as if cast up by an invisible power, and fall to run again on the same spot. They are savage ship stoppers going nowhere. In storms at sea, there's a hellish concert in the rigging, a universal roaring in the air. All hell breaks loose as the sailors shout. Sailors cannot hear one another except by shouting directly into someone's ear. The air is gray with flying water, mountains of water, screaming winds and weariness. Sailors wonder, what are we doing here? The raging sea, not the raging ocean storms of Cape Horn, but a nasty storm on the Sea of Galilee on that day when Jesus slept. And the question among the disciples was the same, what are we doing here? The storm is a great problem, and many of the disciples are experienced fishermen who had lived through many, many storms before, and yet somehow this storm was different, and they were very frightened. Jesus had had an exhausting day and had fallen asleep. He has suddenly awakened with the loud words, Jesus, teacher, don't you care? Well, we know, of course, Jesus cared. The disciples had seen him care for many people across the years and even experienced that healing care for themselves at times. But at this moment in our story, with a storm raging all around them, violently tossing their boat every which way, they were sucked into the illusion of the moment, forgetting the deeper truth that God would reveal to them. And out of fear, they accused Jesus. Teacher, don't you care? That is a question people naturally ask in the storms of life. That is the question asked on the human side of that raging sea. Don't you care? That is the feeling the disciples had when the storm threatened them as Jesus slept. That is the feeling many have as they face the storms of life, crying out to God for help. Answers don't seem to come fast enough at those moments. The ambiguity of the human situation is that at the worst of times, it may seem that God is asleep and doesn't care. In our other reading this morning, we find Job an upright man. You're all familiar with his story. He's the prototype for unjust suffering. He was a man of God, doing his duty faithfully, tending to his farm, taking care of his family, attending worship on a regular basis, and praying every day. And then he got walloped. He turned the corner one day, and along came a Mack truck and plowed him under. Then insult was added to injury. Not only did Job's health break, but his children died. His wife turned on him with accusations and his friends implied that he must have done something wrong to have so many things going wrong in his life, that surely he was receiving a punishment that he deserved. In the midst of it all, he remained faithful for a very long time. 
hoping that the storms of life would soon end and that peace and calm would be restored once more. But eventually, after quite a lengthy time of suffering, the day came when Job turned his resentment outward and blamed God. And then there were Job's friends. Elihu, one of his friends, said to him, Job opens his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. We depend on our friends to support us. But Job found that even his friends had fallen away. In the storms of life, it's easy to enter into speculation and accusations, multiplying words without knowledge. Fear can take over the individual who once was firmly planted in faith. Projection, blaming others or blaming God, can appear to be empty talk. One might even wonder, am I being punished for something? Is God asleep? Job's situation was a breaking point for him, but it also was his turning point because you see, God answered him out of a whirlwind, out of the storm, the Lord spoke to Job. God said to Job, stand up now like a man and answer the questions I ask you. One translation reads, brace yourself and stand up like a man. After all Job had been through, God confronts him with questions. God asks, where were you when I made the world? Who decided how large it should be? Do you know all the answers? Who closed the gates to hold back the sea? Job, have you ever in all your life commanded a day to dawn? And God goes on and on. There are four chapters of this. Instead of being burdened by all these questions, Job, experiences a reversal and reaches a turning point. In a sense, Job crosses over to the other side, the side where God is present, alive and well, listening and caring. In our gospel this morning, Jesus starts out by saying to the disciples, let's go across to the other side. Literally, Jesus was talking about the opposite side of the Sea of Galilee. And symbolically, he was inviting his followers into a new realm, a new experience with God that would enable them to grow in faith and a deeper understanding. When God raised the questions with Job, instead of just listening, Job took in God's words. And as a result of that, he experienced a reversal that brought for him healing and wholeness. That same kind of reversal happened for the followers of Jesus when Jesus stood up in that boat and commanded the wind and the waves to stop. At the beginning of his troubles, Job had lost sight of God because of what was happening around him and to him. His fear of abandonment and his own doubts began to harden inside of him like cynicism. Job lost sight of God when he listened to his friends and his wife and had his own questioning, his own doubts. But Job was able to cross over to the other side with God's help. The questions did not bury Job. Instead, in a sense, they raised him up from the dead. The questions of God that were brought to Job when he was on the wrong side of the sea brought him back to the right side once more. So the questions that God posed of Job worked the great reversal by getting Job's attention centered, centered on something good, something great, something divine, something so overwhelming that Job lost his own self-consciousness and became aware only of that which is holy. 
Once Job experienced a reversal, once he reached the other side, he was able to be restored to health and wholeness and experienced a closer relationship with God. E. Stanley Jones once said, whatever gets your attention gets you. When we give our attention to our problems, they easily become overwhelming. When we give our attention to God, we know that God carries the burden with us. That's what gets us to the other side. When the disciples awaken Jesus from his sleep with their question, don't you care? The Lord raised up to his full height, turned to the storm and commanded the wind and the waves to be still. As the very elements obeyed Jesus, Jesus turned toward his friends and asked them, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? When the storms of life assail us, we might get stuck on the wrong side like Job and like the disciples did. And we might wonder, God, why is this happening? Are you punishing me? Are you there? Have you deserted me? Don't you care? Are you asleep? St. Paul in his letter to his friends in Corinth says, from now on, we are to regard no one, no experience, merely from a human point of view. We are to always remember that God is present, God cares, and God is awake. There is another side. It is with God. God is the center of all things, all experiences, all existence. God is always present in every situation. God cares and never sleeps. We do not need to be afraid. We can be assured and know that God is with us always. Amen.
least the apostles believed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Christ. Amen. We come before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. Equip your faithful people to approach the world with a sense of wonder. Make your church a safe place to explore big questions, troubling doubts, and honest laments. Humble our hearts to receive your love and grace and share it with others. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. We bring inspiration and guidance as we pray for our partners in ministry here in Tina in the Meadowlands Cluster, the Northern Mission District, the New Jersey Synod, Lutheran Social Ministries of New Jersey, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the wider Christian community, our friends from Light and Peace Mission in Haiti, and people of faith everywhere as they live out their calling to serve. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. You spoke creation into order from the chaos of the swirling deep. May your name be praised by rivers and seas, wetlands and waterfalls. Secure clean water for all people and protect water sources from contamination or exploitation. Merciful God, amid whirlwinds of division, violence and conflict, Remind us again that you are as steadfast as the foundations of the earth. Rejuvenate peacemakers, advocates, and community organizers when they feel weary in their work. Rescue those who are being persecuted for their faith, innocent hostages being held against their will, and all who are suffering as a result of war and discrimination. Merciful God, we see our prayer. Deliver your people from their distress, O oh God. We lift before you all who are sick or struggling, and those we pray for in silence or aloud. Grant consolation and peace to all who live with chronic, terminal, or persistent illness. We remember today our brother Fred and the loss of his sister-in-law Mary. Rest eternal, grant her, O oh Lord, and let light perpetual shine on her. In times of affliction or hardship, sustain us in faith. Merciful God, we see our prayer. Enfold all travelers with your protection. Bless the comings and goings of this assembly as we travel for leisure or for work. Let all journeys be met with hospitality on the way, and let community members return to us with celebration. Merciful God, we see our prayer. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation for all the redeemed of the Lord. Join together with the great cloud of witnesses we give thanks for your steadfast love and your wonderful works. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also with you. you.
Jesus, bread of life, who had set this table with your very self, and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us, and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gives himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Again, also after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and these cups, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, oh, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and star, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we say the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, and as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for everyone. Come to the table where all are welcome.
Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Out of food. So, uh, just so you know, there's a follow up. We will be 
uh, packing. I'm not sure how much food we're going to be packing, but we will be fundraising for provisions for local, you know, local provisions. So we may not be packing as much food, but we will be fundraising so that they can stay. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Will the Packathon be in November again? That's yes, it's it's November 9th. It's and we'll uh, hope post it again? We are both presbyterians. Okay, great. And, uh, and we, we share our parking lot for that after I can leave. Yes, which yes, is good. We do, and the meeting closet has a lot of stuff. So, yeah, we, we share a lot. We're all yeah. in this together. That's right. That's good. Thank you. <clears throat> good to hear. I know there's a lot of challenges in Haiti, but I also am aware that there's a lot of good people there trying to make things work and to do what's needed in order to get the food to where it needs to go. And the good news always is, if it doesn't end up on the black market, you know that it's still there and it's being guarded, which is good too. Absolutely. Yeah. And you also know that the money that we send goes to where it's supposed to go. It doesn't get wrapped up in that's the good. Democratic degree and the corrupt government. Yeah, that's good. Thank God. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Good. Well, you probably heard the add on prayer that, that uh, Lynn gave this morning. I sent an email out to her early. Uh, Fred's sister in law, Mary, passed away this morning at 1 o'clock in the morning. And she had received news this week already, or actually the end of last week, it was Sunday now, um, that she needed to go on hospice and there was nothing more the doctors could do. Fred said that while he was down there, he stayed a couple of weeks, I believe, visiting before she learned all this. And he said she actually had rallied. You know, uh, Lise came in from the Netherlands that nobody had seen, I guess, for about a decade. So it was like a family gathering. And Mary, you know, when, when our, our spirits are raised, that helps our health as well. And she rallied a little bit. Uh, and they all had a really good visit together, so that was a gift from God that they were able to enjoy. And then soon after that, after Fred got home, the word came that there was nothing more the doctors could do. They discovered some melanoma, um, and I guess she'd been in treatments for quite a number of years. Uh, I mean, a lot of years. So, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's also a blessing because we know she's in a better place. Um, but Fred called me this morning before Mass because he asked that I pray with him, which I did. So please do keep Fred and his family his brother, this is Charlie's wife, by the way, Fred's brother, Charlie. Um, if you might keep all of them in prayers. It's been a long, long, long journey for everyone. Uh, so that's all I have this morning. I don't know if anybody else has anything more. Try to stay cool. I think we're getting a little bit of a relief tomorrow. But then before the week is out, it's going to be hot and humid again. So I'm glad that you're all careful and stay hydrated. And Stay out of the sun as much as you can. Let us stand and sing together our Sunday.